Hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to our artist focus, which is from out of sight, uh, which is based in Chicago. Um, today we have uh, Daisuka, uh, Daisuka uh, Takia and, uh, from Japan and also from Canada with us today. And uh, so we're going to do land acknowledgements just to start off. And um, so Chicago, where Out of Sight is based, is in the ancestral lands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. And I am coming to you from Edmonton, Canada, on the west side of Canada. And we are in Treaty 6 territory, which is a land that we acknowledge the lands of the First Peoples, the Inuit, and the Métis. And Daiska is in Toronto at the moment. Yeah, I'm coming to you from Toronto, the traditional and unceded territory of uh, many of us nations and peoples, including the Misago of the Credit, the Aoshi Nawabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples living as they were in the North Proto Turtle Island. Fantastic. Good old Turtle Island is Canada. Um, okay. So uh, before we get into, we're going we're gonna to take a close look at two, two of Daiska's pieces. Uh, one that takes place in, in Toronto and the other one in New York. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, we'll, our conversation will probably be deviate from there and we'll probably talk about a lot of things, but to first introduce him, uh, Daisuke was born and raised in Japan and is based in Toronto and Tokyo. He is an interdisciplinary art artist and oftentimes he is a curator, collector, art educator, and community activator. Takaya's praxis is comprised of the exploration of nature and plausibility in contemporary society and hinges on all kinds of double meanings. He has participated in numerous solo and group exhibitions internationally, including shows in Canada, the United States, China, and Japan. Daisuke obtained a Master's of Fine Arts from the Graduate School of Figurative Art at the New York Academy of Art and received a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the School of Visual Arts in New York City. He combines fields of painting, performance art, sculpture, photography, installation, and curatorial praxis. His work emphasizes process in terms of creativity, production, and collaboration, and attempts to approach an understanding of context and environment. And Daiska and I met uh, I guess it's probably a couple of years now mm -hmm. since since we met uh, during the first flow, and uh, and we had the chance to to be able to collaborate together in workshops and have lots of lots of fun. So uh, it's my pleasure to have you here again, okay. and um, to be able to talk more about your work for Out of Sight. And uh, so, why don't we begin with? Uh, a burning pan. Should we start there? Yep. Okay. And if you would like to just introduce this, this is the piece you did in Toronto at the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, uh, August 2020. Uh, uh, there is, uh, there was a festival called Go On, uh, directed and curated by uh, Rafi Ganagonian, uh, who's an independent curator based in Toronto, and I've been uh, friends with him for uh, decades and. Uh, uh, during the pandemic, uh, he thought of uh, what uh, could artists do uh, and not being able to uh, share uh, the physical communication. And uh, uh, my piece uh, kind of tried to uh, bring my room, my apartment, into the uh, back alley of uh, one of the, you know, Tont uh, neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, uh, if we could bring up uh, just the, the video of it. So we'll watch that first. It's about five minutes long. And then we'll be able to talk about the work in, in more detail. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah.
Just that kind of really takes me back to the beginning of the pandemic in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, just the isolation, you know, that that's there and the darkness and and us not sure where 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 we're going with it all in terms of uh, how it's going to impact us and so it physically seems to to show a lot of that. Um, can you give us a little bit about the context of the festival? Uh, yeah, the festival. Um, uh, it, 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 it is a performance art festival, but I'm not too sure exactly what it was about, uh, to be honest with you, but uh, it was the festival to be shown online. So uh, maybe for about a month long, like each week, like one artist uh, showcased uh, uh, the performances and um, uh, I happen to be one of them and the length of each performance of uh, video uh, was like five minutes long so uh, I kind of performed uh, but I sort of edited shortened uh, into five minutes long and uh, I don't know uh, I, I don't recall the context of the festival so much but it, it has something to do with the um, uh, physical uh, distancing and uh, being in private locations and like no gatherings in a public location. So uh, something to do with like combining or mixing or dividing or uh, crossing private and uh, public. Mm -hmm. So my piece uh, was to bring uh, household items like toilet paper, a pan, uh, masks, uh, candles uh, from my apartment and brought it uh, to a uh, public location that was my uh, back alley. Mm. Uh, the funniest thing it was that uh, I was just myself. Maybe my roommates were there, but uh, so I videotaped and no audience and I performed in public place with no audience and like no one. And uh, there was like one car coming from behind me by mm. chance. And I tried to, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, turn off the fire kind of thing. But um, uh, besides the car, like no one came to see it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it was an online uh, showcasing. So my room, uh, I mean, like I, I think uh, people used to the Zoom meetings and like online uh, activities uh, that your room or your office or your kitchen uh, shared uh, with you know people, a anybody online. So your private is becoming uh, public. And back then, like people were wearing masks, like you know, not going to uh, places like stations and airports. And uh, uh, my back alley is a public place, but I happen to be myself, so I felt more private. Yeah. In a public. Yeah. Location. I mean, it was quite surprising because remember um, uh, when you told me that it was it was actually taking place in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And you know Toronto is a very busy city. Yeah. <laughs> There's always lots of activity around, mm -hmm. and I was very struck by how stark the image was at the beginning, with mm -hmm. with that beautiful alley and the light, and then you, you know, and the, just the way everything was following, and and the fact that there really was nobody around. Um, it, it it I don't know how to explain it because that's that's very rare in, in Toronto to be able to have that. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I was I was curious about what time of day you did that. I mean, obviously it's late at night and you're in the summer, but how late at night was it? Uh, it wasn't that late. Maybe it was like nine or ten p.m. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I was a little bit afraid if I did it like you know like three in the morning, then maybe what if like police just pass by, then I can be arrested easily, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which reminds us of the first flow. <laughs> Yeah, it was a uh, friendly police, but yes. Uh, yeah. So it was quite early. So maybe on uh, the front, like a uh, young street, uh, maybe there were some people. Sure. But sure. back alley, like hardly anyone. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, and it was very evident at the beginning with the mask, you know, that we're dealing mm -hmm. with, with COVID with this. Mm -hmm. um, with the toilet paper, I'm curious about that. Because remember at the time, there was a lot of hoarding of toilet paper that was going on in, in, yep. in the stores. Was that, is, is that all a consideration when you chose yes. that object? Yes, like, like a mask, like, you know, like there was like a waiting uh, for like purchasing mask uh, to drug stores and like toilet papers and stuff. Yeah, sure. It was sure. like a very precious thing, but I was consuming it. Like I was burning them. Yeah, yeah. So and um, and then at the end, the sound I thought was was very striking with the sound of the pan mm. at that point with it. Um, yeah, and you know, and the name of the festival because it was called Go On. It's to the outside viewer, it it sounds like you know, okay, COVID hits, everybody's inside, uh, but you know, let's keep going, let's keep going on with our creativity and our, our performance work. And uh, so that, at least just as somebody who wasn't part of that festival or watching, um, that that helps me put your piece in context. Actually, yeah, that sounds quite familiar. So uh, yeah, that was probably the context of the festival. Yeah. yeah, like yeah. go on. We're gonna do it. We're gonna do something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Show must go on, kind of thing. The show must go on. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Can you tell us a little bit about when you started um, doing public performance and what drew you to it? Yeah. Um. Maybe it has something to do with uh, uh, me having uh, some poets, like writers, uh, musician friends in Toronto. Yeah. And uh, I'm a painter. Like I'm, a, I used yeah. to be a studio artist. So I'm just in my studio doing my paintings mostly. Then uh, I didn't really have any uh, uh, collaborations or uh, uh, audience uh, in the processing, uh, mm -hmm. in the producing uh, 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 element. Uh, but I wanted to somewhat, uh, I don't know, communicate with the audience. Uh, and I started collaborating with musicians and I started doing live paintings and uh, like reciting poets or like maybe doing live paintings, uh, something uh, uh, cross genre sort of things I did. I started doing like maybe two decades ago or so. Ooh. Then um, uh, the big tsunami uh, struck uh, Japan 11 years ago. And uh, I did organize a big fundraising event at the Great Hall, uh, a historical building in Toronto. And right. uh, we got like uh, so many artists, uh, uh, musicians, uh, writers participated and uh, we raised like, I don't know, uh, 10 grand uh, over uh, night and sent the money to Japan. Uh, and uh, when we did that, I was like the organizer. So I kind of you know, did communicate with uh, many artists from different uh, uh, backgrounds. And like, you know, it was uh, so inspiring and I wanted to do something more and more with those artists. So okay. that was maybe the beginning of it. So I wasn't really sure what performance art uh, was back then. I was just doing something with uh, artists from different uh, backgrounds. That's what I was doing. And more and more I did it, then I started responding to my own artwork, like installation work. I did it uh, in like museums uh, somewhere. And then I sort of like did performance with my installation. So so I, my actions, uh, my life uh, activities uh, became sort of like part of my artwork kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Then slowly I started uh, meeting with a performance artist and uh, started participating in performance artists like around the world. And, uh, you know, I got to meet so many uh, artists uh, like yourself and uh, I kept on doing more performances. Mm -hmm. And and what what would you say would be the percentage of your work in performance now compared to the other types of work you do? Actually, especially uh, uh, during the pandemic, uh, I, I think physical experience uh, were uh, very much missed. Mm -hmm. and 
and uh, I think there's something great about performance art, sharing the same air, same space, live. And uh, I tend to uh, oops uh, a lot in uh, as a person. I make so many mistakes in my life. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Don't we all? <laughs> yeah. And for instance, like painting, like I can spend as, many, as much time as I, I need to, and I have a perfect control. So any mistakes, brush strokes, I can uh, keep it or paint over or whatever. I have a perfect control. So, uh, so no mistakes okay. or mistakes can be part of the process. But uh, when you do performance art, uh, what if I do, oops, you know, uh, something bro broke or you know, I fall down or something. And then uh, things won't go uh, as I anticipated, as I planned. And, yeah. and I was like, oh my gosh. But then I started understanding that that is okay. And there's something great about uh, something, uh, some kind of like uh, uh, live, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm very much uh, looking uh, into it, like looking forward to it. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, whatever is uh, planable, uh, whatever uh, uh, I can see mm -hmm. before the creation of it, then what's the point of doing it? Mm -hmm. in, in performance art, it's so hard to, uh, uh, you know, uh, predict the outcome. And especially in the public locations, when you do performance art, you have uh, unexpected uh, audiences. Mm -hmm. And like weather might change, start raining or thundering or, you know, place mm -hmm. might come. And those elements are so exciting. Uh, because uh, life uh, is not controllable, like the pandemic, you know, we couldn't do much about what was happening then, you know, uh, but in performance art, like you can uh, kind of improvise and do things. And uh, it can be like even better than how, you know, the artists plan to do it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think you can, you can at least have a frame that you can, go into it with but then you want to leave it open for for chances that happen and, and opportunities that happen mm -hmm. in, in the moment which brings everybody into the present moment at that time yep yes i like that yes yeah so let's let's talk about because i think that's that's a great um that's a great time to shift to this next piece which you did recently uh i think in october in new york city uh, mm -hmm. as part of PAZA, mm -hmm. uh, which was curated by Hector Canage. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and you did this where, where in the festival, what Hector had done is, is take the five boroughs. And so each day you went to a new area. And so the artists were split up between the, the five boroughs of where they were performing. And your piece, which was the Big Apple, was performed in Inwood. Uh, which is right at the uh, the top of Manhattan, up by uh, Washington Heights, and and things up there. Um, so we we do have the five minute video, but do you want to give us just a little bit of an intro into it, uh, without giving away too much? Um, okay. But um, yeah, the uh, the series was titled the um, Impromptus, so everything's like a, a kind of like a impro uh, kind of performances. And uh, mine happened to be like that too. And uh, yeah, maybe why don't we just uh, we'll just the... we'll just see it and then then we'll go from there. Okay, yeah. sure.
That's a, that's a lovely piece. Really oh. lovely piece. I, I, okay, I think everyone wants to know how on earth did you not get the tape all stuck to your hair? That's a good question. Because uh, when you finally pull it off, it just comes off, you know, once you cut it away. Yeah, actually, wow. I, I don't know. I think it's a special kind of tape. Uh, this is the thing. Oh, it's not duct tape. It's not duct tape. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of shiny thing. Uh, okay. Yeah, but I was surprised too. I uh, came off really easily. Uh, when I do performances, usually I make a big mess. Yeah. And uh, the the staff of the festival, museums, the galleries, uh, they help me cleaning up the mess. Right. So people hate me because of that. <laughs> but uh, maybe because uh, we have been experiencing the pandemic, uh, the everyone sort of gathered around me after my performance and tried to rescue me. And that was great. And I think that was probably the best part of the, my performance. I, I think it's it's just stunning at the end. And it could be its own performance piece, right? On its own is that is you enter with all of that and then people start cutting away. And of course, it, it reminds us of Yoko Ono's cut piece, you know, with, with mm -hmm. that of people trying to get in there and, and one mm -hmm. by one. But mm -hmm. I, and, and also, I mean, almost going backwards in our conversation, but the, when you go onto the police barricades, which of course, when you're all covered, I mean, it's incredibly dangerous. And, and I think that, produces a lot of empathy in us and wanting to make sure you're okay. And so when you finish, of course, you can't just step down, you know, so then everybody, everybody comes in, but it's, it's lovely to see every, everyone trying to help you with that. Mm -hmm. And then slowly we see your face uncovered. Yeah, it was really cool. Like I, I mean, I didn't expect that, but uh, I, people were very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also the, uh, you know, you, you have the apples at the beginning. Those are the largest apples I think I've ever seen. Those are massive apples. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then you become the apple, right? Yeah. And you're in the big, big apple. So, yeah, so like that. that's mm -hmm. happening there. Yeah. And actually, like, people gathered at the end of uh, my performance to rescue me. So that's the big apple. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not the actual apple, but, like, people are making the big apple kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, but it yeah. happened to be that way, but I didn't plan to do it that way. And actually, yeah, uh, my performance, I was going to do that in the uh, deeper, uh, in the park. Mm -hmm. So I was expecting like no public audience, but I was going to do something with, uh, I don't know, the big uh, tree trunks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was going to perform on the hill. So the apple was going to like, uh, you know. Oh, like, roll down roll down and uh, people like the audience or the other performers gonna like you know trying to catch them kind of thing i was going to do it yeah i changed it and uh i changed it because i saw like those uh police uh barricades and like they're so attractive and i wanted to do something on it so there's so okay we we have we do have to tell the story from flow one yeah. um because you did a piece and you were in japan at the time Mm -hmm. And uh, and and the police came and stopped you in the midst of you performing live. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to tell a little bit about that, and then then we can go back to the police barricades and why that attracted you yeah. so much? Yeah, <laughs> so I did that uh, performance for Flow. Uh, I think it was two years ago. Two so? years ago, yeah. Yeah, and two thousand and twenty-one. Um, well, okay, and uh, yeah, I did it in my neighborhood in my hometown. And it's like a countryside of Japan and uh, like police has like nothing to do. It's so peaceful, like no crimes whatsoever. So they have nothing to do. They just drive around and have coffee, like, you know, here and there kind of thing. So I was doing something on the street and like, I think the police by chance, you know, saw me doing something. And uh, they've never seen anyone doing, you know, something weird in my hometown. So, so they wanted to, rescue me or something so they came to me and i was gonna get arrested or whatever no uh uh they said like you know are you okay there might be a car coming you know and it's oh, so they weren't even it wasn't even a possible arrest it was just they no no it wasn't an arrest you. at all so the police came and and are you okay 
then the, there might be you know the cars like you know coming by and you can get run over so you shouldn't be doing this here and yeah. i said you know it's a countryside and like only maybe one car in every five minutes and like you don't have to worry about me i'm okay i'm from here and but, what kind of action were you doing just so we can get that picture in our mind i can't remember exactly but i think i was shaving yeah okay. like sh shaving with a like yeah. foam and shaving <laughs> in a public place. <laughs> uh, and I don't know why I did that. I, and I maybe I did something on a like crossroad or something, but no. Yeah, I think I think I remember you sort of being at a yeah a intersection. Yeah. Yeah. So it was quite spontaneous. So I couldn't remember exactly what I was doing. Yeah. And I maybe yeah, uh, I, I, I didn't know what I was doing when I was doing it. So So when you saw the police bar uh, barricades here did it remind you sort of of that moment? Actually, yes and no. Uh, but I used to live in New York City, like in Alfred yeah. City, like on Avenue A. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was really dangerous time. Like, you know, they used to have like, you know, Tom Kinsker, uh, mm -hmm. Park riots and all that. So mm -hmm. it was really dangerous, like all roads. Yeah, dropped. I was living in New York at that time, yeah. Yeah, so that reminded me uh, of like, you know, how it was then. Like I wanted to do something with the, and it's a public place. And mm -hmm. uh, what if I did something with a police thing? Then maybe the police car might stop. Then maybe <laughs> he or she might like stop me or something. Mm -hmm. Then that could have been interesting interaction. So I was expecting, uh, you know, a police to come, but no one came. So <laughs> <laughs> you can get away with a lot more in New, in New York <laughs> than you had in Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah in terms of that can you tell us a little bit about we saw the boy at the very beginning mm -hmm. of the piece and mm -hmm. uh you know when he find he takes an apple can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about that exchange where did he come from uh was he on his own was he in the audience or was it just somebody walking by i think yeah i think he was just like walking by Oh, I don't know. Maybe he could have been with uh, his guardians. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. But he was like paying attention to what I was doing. And I noticed him. And, uh, you know, I happened to have many apples. So why not giving it to him? Because I bought the, uh, those apples uh, in the morning in Manhattan at the fresh market. Yeah. And uh, I mean, they looked really delicious. And, uh, you know, so before I started using it for the performance, it was like nice to have some exchanges. Yeah. And I didn't know how would the audience would uh, interact uh, with me. And I usually, I many times uh, interact with the public audience. And sometimes it can be very scary because I'm a weird person, uh, you know, coming up to you and, you know, maybe one could scream or something but then having an apple like you know i felt like maybe it's not scary to walk up to somebody so yeah but did wasn't he the one who reached for it or did you did you offer it actually yeah uh, i thought you had placed them and then I, he was kind of really curious about one yeah he was curious but then uh, i was like you know I was trying to offer the apple to anybody, but like adults, you know, they don't come to me. So yeah, I think I think uh, he 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 came up to me. He he was a brave one. He might become a very um, uh, famous performance artist in the future. So. <laughs> I I love I love when children interact with art. Yep. Because you know, there's there's absolutely no almost no context in some ways and yet they totally identify because of the play aspect of it mm -hmm. um, but i also thought it was a poignant image because i mean we just went through halloween and as you know in north america um, there used to be a tradition of putting apples in kids bags but then that became a dangerous thing to do so like whenever uh -huh. i would come home and if there was a couple of apples in there my mom would take them out right away uh -huh. because there was this sort of at least an urban myth of that there might be a razor blade or it might be poisoned or something you know and that candies of they were wrapped that was okay so with the apple and a child we kind of get a couple of images there because we get the you know an apple for a teacher and that really nice feeling about learning and 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 we also get i mean in terms of adam and eve 
but then there's also this little bit of danger of, of you know, will he bite into the apple and is that okay to accept an apple from a stranger? So I, I kind of, it kind of had both in the in those moments, and then and then from there you go into the the taking of the branches and sticking them into each apple, and and I was struck by um, I believe you have a another piece and Quran if you if you have it and if I'm talking about the right one, uh, where you've used branches before this is the a tree, a tree fire river, um, and. And so I wanted just to check in with you about, oh, there's children too, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, about you consciously taking branches to be able to put into the apples. Is this a motif you use or is it just happens to be in these two pieces? Uh, just happened to be in uh, these pieces. Uh, mm -hmm. I've liked uh, my performances to be very uh, site specific. Uh, meaning wherever I go, uh, wherever I perform, I'd like to find elements uh, from the very locations. Uh, so I collected the tree branches because they were there and I bought apples because there was a fresh market. And right. uh, if the market wasn't there, I wouldn't have used apples. And uh, the tree branches, I use it a lot. Uh, because I don't cut the trees, but uh, I find tree branches on the soil and um, they look very beautiful and attractive, but they're kind of dead by. Kinda... Yeah, and especially up in Inwood. <laughs> For some reason, <laughs> for some reason, they just, I think whenever I have the image of it, I don't have a leafy. I mean, I know it gets leafy at some point, but I always kind of have the image of the bare trees up there. Mm -hmm. So I kind of wanted to, you know, bring them to life kind of thing mm. by connecting it to like, you know, live apples and stuff. So, so I don't have any particular mm -hmm. um, uh, materials that I always use. Uh, maybe some of the uh, favorite materials that I use, but I not limited to any. And um, uh, this particular piece and the river, uh, it was in Nepal. And uh, when uh, we visited uh, there, uh, there was like uh, somebody, uh, a person uh, 65 years old uh, passed away and they have the tradition of like, uh, uh, burning the cremation, uh, yeah, cremation, and then uh, send the body to uh, by the river, uh, mm -hmm. kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I kind of went into the river uh, after this ceremonial uh, gathering, mm -hmm. and uh, I wanted to do something with life and death, and yeah. uh, so I collected those three branches. Because I think the, the life and death is an image that came to me or, or a concept with the, you know, an apple, which is usually growing on a very live tree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it only grows on a live tree. Mm -hmm. uh, but the branches themselves are dead branches that you're using and you're puncturing, mm -hmm. actually d doing a, a bit of physical violence to be able to get it in there. And mm -hmm. yet it's, it's quite beautiful to have it, have it stem up uh from them but then you have the moment i love the moment when you you've, you've put in you put in the branches and then the big branch just slowly it doesn't fall fast it slowly just collapses with that mm -hmm. and of course you didn't plan that but it has such a moment of beauty to it and i wonder if you could speak to that yes uh, i like something uncontrollable uh in my performances uh, and I would like to sort of borrow the elements of the environments. And um, so things are uh, ha happen to happen uh, in natural order. And uh, most of those things I cannot uh, anticipate. And uh, I yes try to do things in life or in my performances, but uh, many things don't uh, happen as I wished. Uh, the outcomes are quite different. Mm -hmm. Oh, great! Because I was just thinking about this piece. Thank you so much, Karan. Um, so this is th this is the piece of, if I'm right, in Japan. Mm -hmm. Is this correct? After yep. the tsunami. Yeah, 
I did this performance in、uh, Tomioka town in Fukushima prefecture.、Uh, I don't know if you uh, uh, remember that uh, there uh, was a big、uh, nuclear plant explosion、uh, yes. happened、uh, when tsunami struck、uh, the area. So we were at a very close location、uh, when I performed here. So this is like a public、uh, location. And、uh, the area used to be like a rice field. But because of the radiation, they couldn't uh, uh, you know, uh, make uh, produce rice anymore. So they、uh, used to have like、uh, piles of like、uh, contaminated soils around here, around the area. But then afterwards,、uh, they put like、uh, solar panels. So, so the background, like there are like so many like you know, miles and miles of solar panels. And I sort of like try to reach the sun.、Uh, mm -hmm. By climbing up the tall ladder, and I connected like poles and like, you know, put the fire、mm -hmm. and try to, you know,、uh, create energy.、Mm -hmm. But then I fell here.、Uh, the fire sort of spread out like and falls down, and it was a big mess.、Mm -hmm. And、uh, I sort of、uh, wanted to create、uh, the moment where、uh, human civilization tries to. Be intelligent and create energy, uh, uh, but then you know, uh, you know,、uh, we cannot really control things, and、uh, yeah, I did something about that. Um, I have a question, I've got a couple questions for that.、Mm -hmm. Or, how do, I, how do I ask this? It, In, in when you said that you know we can't always control things and and that there's a there's an essence of failure that happens、mm -hmm. did you know that going in or is that something that now you realize the piece becomes that because of because of what happened in the moment、uh, that's a good question、uh, so obviously the nuclear plant that they couldn't control when uh, uh, the earthquake、uh, took place. And、um, I wanted to do something about that. So I was going to do something that I cannot control. Okay, as opposed to taking back control. Yes,、uh, yes, and no. Actually,、um, uh, it was actually open ended.、Uh, so I wasn't planning to be able to control afterwards. Yeah. So,、uh, but I didn't create a disaster with my performance, but it could have become a disaster. Yes, there's an opportunity for it. Yeah, because there are like many,、uh, you know, weeds, wild weeds、sure. around. And、uh, yeah, yeah, it was、uh, quite. Yeah. Maybe that can lead me into a question about the role of failure in public performance、mm -hmm. and how that itself is, an, is, is a medium to work with.、Mm -hmm. um, And, and it sounds like that has played in several of your performances. That there's been something, as we all you know, come, come across this, something unexpected. But in, in some cases, something unexpected helps, helps bring it up, or something unexpected could be seen as a failure by somebody else in terms of the tree falling. But, it's such, but it has such beauty within it. Yeah. And, and, and we embrace the failures. That's actually material. Yeah,、uh, actually, this piece is called F. It's like F、uh, for Fukushima, but it's also for failure to. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. like,、uh, you know, like in North America, the gray is like A to F. Yeah, yeah. yeah.、Um, so, yes, I believe in failures. Uh, actually, uh, maybe I believe in uh, creativity. Uh, the real creativity can be. Happening、uh, when where、uh, failure is possible.、Yeah. I used to be an elementary school art teacher for about a decade in Toronto,、oh. and、um, I made my classroom,、uh, I covered the entire classroom with, like, you know,、uh, covered up. So the, my students were allowed to make mess. You like you covered the cupboards themselves had. 
I don't know, canvas classroom. or paper. The art or... classroom, yeah, like, yeah, like plastic <sighs> and everything. So every day, like, after uh, all the uh, students are gone, I had to clean up for like two, three hours every day. Oh my gosh. Yeah, because I believe that the fail, uh, you know, within the failure, there's some discoveries and yes. real creativities cannot be uh, ha happening when uh, they're like adults are like, you know, overseeing uh, the situations and yeah. if you're too careful, uh, I mean, it cannot be happening. So I tend to make mistakes in life yeah. and uh, I tend to, uh, I tend to enjoy oops. Yes. Performances. Yes. And the oops is like, I don't intend to make mistakes, but something don't go as I plan or I uh, wish for. But those mistakes or failures or uh, accidents mm -hmm. can become a new discovery and, uh, oh, what do I do? And uh, do I panic or I pretend that like I plan to do it that way kind of thing and, mm -hmm. you know, make another piece. So my performances are quite narrative. Uh, so from the beginning till the end, I don't, I, I don't usually know what would be the outcome, mm -hmm. uh, what would, would be the end. Yeah. It's, it's, the, it's that element of risk, which is, which is always a, a wonderful thing to work with. I, yeah. I knew a theater company uh, way back in the 80s uh, out of Sweden, and they purposely would have something go wrong near the beginning of, of their show. Wow. And, and the actors wouldn't know exactly what was going to go wrong, but something was going to go wrong. And, and I remember talking to them afterwards and and saying you know because I, I just remember that feeling as soon as something happened i just went like you know i was so present and they said yeah we use that as, as as a technique to get everybody in the room and know that this is only happening now and and so i was quite surprised that this was something that they repeat um and then there's also look at that stark image uh there was a there was a festival in brighton i believe uh called tempting failure Wow. Which which all the pieces had to do with failure in some way. Um, wow. What is what is this piece? Uh, this one was in Indonesia, uh, Palu Sulawesi. Uh, uh -huh. Actually, this area I went there uh, for different project. Uh, actually, this area was uh, uh, struck by a tsunami mm -hmm. uh, when I went there, and I went there maybe within thirty days or something. And the people were sort of like afraid of water because you know the big incident happened. But I decided to do a performance in the ocean. Uh, and people were like, you know, behind me. And uh, I went to the ocean. So, uh, and I, it's called one, one hundred. Uh -huh. And I counted uh, one, 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 a uh, hundred times. hundred times. Yeah. And as I did that, I went to the water and uh, sort of like, uh, you know, got the water in the buckets and yeah. uh, uh, brought them, you know, uh, back to the land. And uh, uh, this is this was not too much of the accident, uh, but maybe I wanted to do something with the incident. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because, you know, in, in Japan, you had the, you know, the tsunami there and, and you've got two pieces with it, but I'm also noticing the branch and, and the fact that, you know, the branches that, that have, they have two sides to it and then go into one and can be used as a, as a divine, what do we call it? A divining stick? Like that helps to search for things, but you know, that this almost is bringing energy from the sky back mm -hmm. to you, back to the earth. And it also reminds us, of course, of the lightning bolt and the storm with that, within mm -hmm. that. Um, we are almost out of time because it goes by so quickly, but you've, you've given us a lot of examples of your work and I've been very struck with also all the natural elements that you're using in your pieces. Uh, whether here it's obviously the water, but also wood um, and fire in, in the other piece. And, and so bringing that into your practice, I think is, is quite lovely. And sometimes you're in urban settings with that, which of course has its own resonance to it. Mm -hmm. um, I guess before we go, uh, because I do have some announcements, but do you, do you want to say anything just as a, as a wrap up yourself? 
Um, yeah, I'd like to thank you and uh, Kieran Letro uh, out of sight uh, for organizing uh, this talk. And I'm not a very good uh, speaker. About... Oh, you are. Really? Come on. Yes. Okay. I, I always love talking to you. Uh, yeah. But I am. Um, uh, but if I perform, then I, I can do well, meaning uh, maybe I make many mistakes as I, you know, as in speaking, but uh, uh, they, they might look okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they become part part of it, right? A yeah, fabric yeah. in it. Which, yeah, which is really lovely. Yeah, and well, thank I feel, you. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like uh, I can continue doing this for like a decades, yeah. and uh, when I'm like really, really old, yeah, and uh, maybe people cannot uh, realize if I'm suffering or performing, or that that could be a lot of fun. We'll all be in the same festival. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. We'll all be very elderly and in the same festival. That'd be really nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, Daisuke, I, I really want to thank you for joining us. Uh, that thank was just lovely much. to be able to learn more about your work. Thank and you. See it in different continents as well. Okay. And um, so thank you. Okay. And next week we have Wei Zen Ho, who is from uh, Australia. Both of us also also know Wei Zen. And she will be presenting her work in conversation with Ecatrix. Uh, and this broadcast will be at the regular artist focus time because, because this time we had Europe had already done the daylight savings time, but North America hadn't. We go into in North America daylight savings time as of Sunday. So next week we'll all be on the same time. And the way to be able to tell when it is, is 11.15 a.m. Chicago time, where Out of Sight is based. And uh, for those of you in Europe, it is 6.15 or 18.15 ECT. And so we'll all adjust our clocks and get us all on the same planet with it, which would be great. Okay. Well, thank you again, Daiska. Thank you, Karan, for all the technical work on the other side of the of this and thank you everyone for joining us for another artist focus and we look forward to seeing you next week okay thank you